Now, the final focus as we shift is going to be in this area. Okay, so in light of changes that are happening in our society, our mission field, and in light of the, some of the ways that churches have been wrestling to respond to these challenges, as well as uh, embrace those new opportunities that are coming, how should we think about the preparation of future pastors and other Christian leaders? Um, so here we are sitting at the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, whose mission is to prepare pastors and other Christian leaders for tomorrow's ministries. Any, any advice, any recommendations for a school like ours in terms of, here are the qualities that would be very important uh, for your students if they were to be effective pastors and Christian leaders in the coming uh, reality. And given those qualities, what might be some ways to prepare them, right, as they go through their seminary training? Uh, now, Michael, you're a sociologist, uh, but you are very attentive to the needs of the church, and three of us are graduates of this same institution. <laughs> so looking back, our own experience, there are some things that we can incredibly be grateful for. But then there were also some gaps. What are those? How do we fill that? Well, I would say that um, this, the school here has to do a, a a remarkably thorough job of contextualizing the education that they are delivering. And that means the whole gamut from curriculum to delivery systems. Like I'm a product of the, the urban program, which is down in the city. I only took two classes up here on the main campus. I was on the main campus three times, the two classes and to graduate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but even in that, that uh, taking those two courses, it was very apparent, and this is 12 years ago, that the main campus is a totally different animal than the program that I was going through. Yeah. Now, being involved with the campus in the last five years, uh, I think that things have gotten a lot better, and I think that Trinity and is, is on the right track in terms of making the types of changes that need to happen. I know the president, President Williford, this is his heart. He wants to see it happen. You know, my old professor, Dr. Tianu, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm so excited about what's happening on this campus. But I think that's the new day. Mm -hmm. The new day is, it can't, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt here. I'm being taped, but I'm going to be <laughs> yes. blunt. Um, it can't be an education geared towards white, upper, middle class males. It can't just serve their interests. Otherwise, we will, we will cease to be an institution that produces effective leaders for the 21st century. Okay. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah. So hopefully I don't get fired or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I'm not seminary trained, so I speak out of some ignorance. I would say, though, that for me, my training, what I get from being in churches in evangelical churches was that, and I've learned to put these in bigger terms, right, as an academic, that the moral project of evangelicalism has always been conversion of an individual. It's about the individual. Mm. And when you look at the Bible fully, I don't see God just caring about the individual. I see him mm. rewarding and, and, and punishing and celebrating community mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. right alongside with individuals. Mm -hmm. So I would see that what would really just make my heart leap for joy is places like Trinity, and I know it's already happening, that the moral project is individual and the community, yeah. mm -hmm. and bringing those together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, two quick things. I don't know if uh, Trinity still has field education, Peter. Mm -hmm. Do you? Okay. I think every student uh, ought to do a field ed in a church context very different from the one they grew up in. And yeah. they do now. Cross-cultural feel that okay. it is required. It is. And it's some required. students really lament <laughs> <laughs> because they okay. have to go out of their church sure. to look right. for that yeah. cross-cultural yeah. experience. Because yeah. right. I, I think those are sort of catalytic moments mm -hmm. for, for folks. And so, the, and the secondly, I would say this, and, and maybe this gets to a little bit of what you're saying. The most profound shaping influence for me, outside of the academics and class and so on and so forth, were the relationships I had on campus mm -hmm. with other students. Mm -hmm of color and other different experiences. Mm -hmm. That for me 
was an education in and of itself. I was serving in a, an immigrant Korean American context, and so majority of my ministry life experience was dealing with that context. And then I had the classrooms. So this third area, you know, in which I was able to interact theologically, biblically, culturally with other students on campus who mm. thought differently, who held different ministry philosophy. Those years that I was here, that was a profoundly shaping experience for me. And so um, I, don't, I don't know how to program that because for me it's essentially a culture that's on a campus. And it's good to see a lot more diversity uh, here. But I'm, I'm wondering if that kind of a cultural shaping thing could be a normal, natural part of the student body here. Mm. And that is a challenge because as we... I, I, I always say that the divinity schools and seminaries are leading the way in using technology to be able to get deliver the knowledge and everything through not having to be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. we lose something. We do. Powerful. We do. Yeah. We do. You know, I sort of commuted, mm. but I was only 10, 15 minutes away, so I, I intentionally found myself on campus quite often. It was for that purpose. Mm. Yeah. It was oxygen to me to interact with and have community with these men and women that were on campus knowing that they were going to do radically different ministry than I was. But looking back, I didn't realize like, how much that profoundly shaped and impacted me. You know, I, I don't think it can be programmed, but it speaks to why a campus has to be diverse. Yes. Yes. I agree. You know, I agree. Know, Starbucks sort of built its empire on the whole third space philosophy of we're not a coffee shop, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not home, we're not work, we're the third space, mm -hmm. you know. And so can this campus be sort of a diversity third space, mm. you know, mm. when you have a good mix of different races and different mm. social classes, different genders, when you're getting your coffee or you're yep. hanging out or whatever, yep. that's where a whole new education, non-formal education takes place, which will profoundly affect you as a seminary yep. student mm. just as much as taking a class. Mm -hmm. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I think especially on our campus, uh, we have a very significant presence of students from other nations around the world mm -hmm. and and uh, the wisdom and the insights that they bring to the classroom Absolutely. and conversation outside the classroom has I think enriched faculty members and students as well and uh, those are huge uh, benefits and blessings that come with that increasing diversity on campus mm -hmm. um, now you all have had chance to observe uh, pastors who are doing very effective ministry in uh, diverse ministry context. Um, what are some traits that you have seen in those pastors who really enable them to serve as a pastor to this very multi-racial, cultural, diverse congregation? I think it takes a particularly diff different kind of pastoral gift or strength to do that. I wonder if you could speak to that. Uh, from what you have observed, what are some traits or strength that you saw in those pastors who were able to particularly serve well in that context? And that might be another way of thinking about how do we do our seminary preparation to increase that kind of traits and strength among our graduates. Yeah. I've actually been wanting to ask you, I don't have any sociological data to support this, but it seems to me that being a white male would make it most challenging <laughs> to pastor multi-ethnic churches. And I was wondering if you knew of examples of white males who are doing fruitful multi-ethnic ministry. There are, but they've right. gone through transformational experiences mm -hmm. or they grew up very untraditionally okay. or they mm -hmm. interracially okay. yep. married. Yeah. And, yeah. Yep. But it has to be something so like that. So there's some quality yeah. characters mm -hmm. trait like that. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd say 100% of the pastors who I know of, who successfully pastor multi-ethnic churches, have what you call transformational experiences, life experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. They were either grew up on military bases where it was diverse, <laughs> or they played sports and it was very diverse, or, or they lived in a neighborhood like you experienced where it's very diverse. But I have yet to run into one who when you, when you scratch beneath the surface and you say, why are you doing this, or mm -hmm. where's your training really come from? that doesn't talk about a major life experience that has prepped them. Yes. And, it's, and it's a long life experience. It's not, I went and volunteered for a week. It's right. for 10 years I right. did this, or for yeah. five years I did that, or I grew up 
in this particular context. And it's that life experience which serves as their foundation for everything else that they do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the way that they see their theology, mm-hmm. the way they do their ministry practice, it's all based on that foundation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I fully agree. I also think it takes, um, and I don't know if you can teach this, but it, you have to be humble because you, no matter who you are, you can never know everything. So you have to be willing to be able to learn, to, to be flexible, mm-hmm. to change, to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, so that's a common trait I see. Mm. Humility mm-hmm. as a learner, as lifelong learners. Yeah. Good. What about you, Peter? Um, intuitive or highly intuitive? Yeah, mm. that's a good one. Yeah, I've, I've noticed they're not sort of give me all the facts and data and let me just con- compile it and go through it and this. But intuitive, you mentioned uh, humility. I and mean, for me, uh, one of the things that. that because the reality is, I don't share common experience with the majority of the congregation. Yeah. I didn't grow up in their context, you know? And so what enables a congregant, when they sit down with me, to go, I think this guy understands me. It, it can't be because I understand experientially what they've gone through. Yeah. But I think there is an, maybe an, that's only what I can think of as intuitive or intuition, but the sense of, um, without having all the facts and data and, and uh, maybe an ability to kind of go, I think this is what the Spirit of God is doing. I think this is what the Spirit of God is is moving in and so on and so forth. That might make absolutely no sense, but that's that's something that I've noticed, I guess, in some of the other folks that I've interacted with. Does that make any sense well, at I all? Well, I think you named actually the primary one. You said it in, in the previous session as well, which is the call of God. Yeah. Yeah. That God has called. I mean, all three of us share. God called us. God called you to move and, and write the book. God called you to go into Peter's office and say, "I need to." God called me to start that church in the midst of the return. I think actually that trumps everything. I think it flows out of that. So does it mean I don't have to do it if I'm not called? <laughs> you might not have to lead it. <laughs> yes, you could do it, but I think yeah. if you're going to lead it. There has yeah, to be a yeah. sense yeah. that God's called me to go through the trials and tribulations that I need to go through. Yeah. Yes. And Peter, can I just mention this yeah. one other thing? I, I, I've been told, because I, I, I haven't been to you know, uh, all the multi-ethnic churches, but the ones that I've been to and talking to other pastors and other leaders, I've been told that in healthy multi-ethnic, con- multi-racial congregations, and I have to be very careful how I say this, but there is a dimension of a clear, palpable, tangible work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That we're not really in charge of this. We don't know how it happens. Yes. 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 But yeah. it's happening. Yeah. I, that, and that, for me, has is, is been kind of, that's what I've been told about multi, the multi-racial congregations, mm-hmm. that there is that sense of, you know that the Spirit of God is at work here. And we're not talking about, you know, some fringe sort of Pentecostal, like that type of right. thing. but. A clear, palpable, tangible way in which the Holy Spirit is at work. Mm. And key leaders are submitted and surrendered that's right. to the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's where, you know, again, this humbleness matters, that mm-hmm. being willing to do that, to mm-hmm. submit. I don't know better. Yeah. God knows better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. That, that is a nice segue to the last question, and I think this will wrap up our conversation this afternoon. And that is, there are so many public and secular institutions that are committed to the goal of diversity or unity in diversity. Um, It's my belief, and I I think you might share this belief as well, the church, though, has a very unique resource that we can do this, uh, that the secular institutions may try and fail. Um, If that's your conviction, what is that thing that enables church as a spiritual institution to to really live out this reality we're talking about that the secular institutions may not have in its in toolkit, okay? Well, what do you, and you mentioned the palpable work and presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What might be other things that would bring God's people together in such a compelling way that they might be willing to join the journey of reconciliation? I think the church has a very clear narrative uh, modeled in Christ and his disciples in the early church that says this is what we're called to be that provides us we're sent the comforter the the spirit to do exactly what you said christ knew we would need that Um, we are told that we will knock down dividing walls 
and that our witness will be our unity. So then we have Christ in John 17 giving us that incredible prayer that we would be. So we've got a lot of people working on our behalf. I think <laughs> and we need that. We are divided. I always I try not to get so into it's, it's just the devil against God, but the devil really does work and the devil really does spend all the time trying to twist, divide, destroy. So I, it's hard for me to fathom, no matter how well-intentioned a secular organization is, to try to come together but deny the work of the Spirit and not submit themselves to that, that they can ever get beyond what the devil wishes to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, the difference with us is when you look at secular organizations, um, the motive is either legal, some sort of profit, not necessarily financial, but some sort of profit, there is a moral imperative as well from a humanitarian universalistic perspective. Yeah. But the church is the only institution that God said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, that he is giving us the gift of reconciliation. Mm. That it is his work through us to be ambassadors. Yes. And that's what sets the church apart mm -hmm. because we really have no other reason to do it mm -hmm. you know you can get fired if you do this mm -hmm. so there's not necessarily any other motive you, you're definitely not gonna get rich doing it you know mm -hmm. um, there is no legal imperative um, it's yeah. truly this is what the scriptures say this is what God has called us yeah. to do and God said that he's going to do it through us mm -hmm. that's that that Holy Spirit yeah. presence yeah. that when things are going right you're seeing Second Corinthians five literally play out in front of you. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, the end goal is Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. The end goal is glory of God. The end goal is not multi-ethnicity, multiracial. Yep, that's, right. exactly. that's not the end goal. Mm -hmm. right. It's not so that we can sit around and go, "Isn't this great?" The end goal is so that Christ might be lifted up and God would get all the glory. Mm -hmm. And amen. amen. I think that's a very hope-giving note to end our conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you. you.